We need more wind power, and we need it fast. Climate change is not waiting. And if we want to avoid the worst consequences, then by 2050, 26 years from now, uh, the global wind power capacity will have to be 10 times larger than it is today. Now that's a massive expansion. Last year, only a quarter of the required amount was added. So we're not expanding fast enough. Strangely enough, after decades of falling costs, wind power is the cheapest available source of electricity in many places around the world, together with solar power. So why are we not expanding faster? It's not only the politicians. Wind energy is just not the perfect energy product. So the winds don't blow where we want them to, when we want them to. And on top of that, um, harvesting these winds takes up much more place than most other energy sources do. Now, most experts agree that if we want to keep somehow come close to our expansion goals, we need to not only further reduce costs, but we need to um, improve on all three of these challenges as well. Now, the good news is these issues are not carved into stone. So rather, they are closely tied to the altitude at which we tap into the wind resource. This is, for example, a map of the average wind power density in Germany. Once at 100 meters altitude, once at 200 meters altitude. Um, blue denotes, of course, low wind availability, green to red, medium to high availability. Now, at 100 meters altitude, you see that most of the high quality wind sites are located in the north. In the south, where a lot of electricity is consumed, most wind sites are of a lower quality. So as wind power is going to be expanded in the north, a lot of the electricity generated is going to be, have to be transmitted to the south. And we see that by just increasing the altitude to 200 meters, we open up a lot of more interesting wind sites across the country and we can avoid this problem. Variability. Let's have a look at such a low wind site in the south, one that we know very well, Freiburg. So what I did here was I took some real wind data and I put a virtual wind turbine in this wind field and I simulated the power output. Now this wind turbine is 150 meters high and we're looking at the first week of January in 2017. Now we see that there's only one day of real power production here. It's really a bad wind location. <laughs> now what I did then was I took this wind turbine and I virtually placed it at an altitude of 500 meters. Now it becomes interesting, because now I'm also producing energy at other times, and at the same time, I'm reducing the time where I'm not producing energy at all. Okay. What about land use? Why do wind turbines take up so much space? The reason is wind shadowing. So if I would place all of these turbines really close together, then one wind turbine would take away all the wind for the one directly behind it. So I need to place them really far apart so that the wind has some time to recover before it hits the next wind turbine. Now, if I could make the height of these uh, wind turbines variable, then we could somehow avoid this problem and save a lot of space. But we can't. And let me show you with a simple example what this means. So, Take the city of Freiburg, and let's say we want to provide the city of uh, Fre we want to um, provide half of the yearly uh, electricity consumption of Freiburg with a wind farm, taking into account the real wind data that I showed uh, before. The result looks like this. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't place wind turbines near Freiburg, but it's going to be expensive. This wind farm is only producing a minimum amount of power for 50% of the time. So I'm going to need a lot of storage, backup capacity. And also, I don't think it needs an explanation that the environmental impact will lead to a lot of resistance. So what is the answer of the wind industry? Um, 
towards these issues. Of course, it's building taller and taller wind turbines in order to try and catch these high altitude winds. But building such tall um, tower-based wind turbines, these are, they need to be realized in giant construction projects that uh, they swallow enormous amounts of concrete and steel. And they also come with a lot of other challenges as well. <laughs> so the question is, can we reach these high altitude winds in a smarter way? And for the answer, we need to go back to 1980, where an American engineer called Miles Lloyd investigated the idea of doing so with kites. Now, get it, right? It's intuitive. Kites fly, they can reach high altitudes effortlessly, and you can also change the, vary the altitude as much as you want. Now, I'm not a kite surfer, but a couple of summers ago, we went on a family trip, and one of the things that we took was this little kite. Now, it may seem little, but it was actually the cause for a lot of arguments between my daughter and me. So she was having a lot of fun unwinding the entire kite line <laughs> and then looking at it really high up in the sky. But what we were arguing about was, of course, that after a while, when she got bored, I was the one to pull the kite line back in. Now, it doesn't look like much, but I was really surprised about the force that I needed to pull this little kite back in. So you can really pull a lot, of en a lot more energy out of the sky than you would think at first sight. Now, of course, for a full-fledged wind power system, we're going to need to change this setup still a little bit. So the idea of Miles Lloyd was not to use like a soft wing as a wing structure, but more something like an airplane wing. Why? Because it's airplane wings are much more aerodynamically efficient. That means that they don't have a lot of air resistance, while at the same time being able to produce a very large lift force. Now, in the same lift force that an airplane uses to carry a lot of weight, we are now going to use to keep our kite airborne and to pull the kite line. Okay. Now, you don't want this system to be controlled by a four-year-old girl, or by anyone for that matter. Uh, it's a technical system, it should be fully autonomous. So inside of the wing is a computer system that navigates the wing and that takes all of the decisions. Now, for an airplane it holds that the faster it goes, the higher the lift force is. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're also going to let our system fly really fast circular loops in a plane that is almost perpendicular to the wind speed. And looking at this time-lapse photo, we can really see that we have now created a flying wind turbine. So the wing, the wing is following the trajectory or the flight path of the outer rotor tips of a wind turbine. But the inner parts of the rotor and the tower that don't really contribute much to power production anyway, they've disappeared. We just replaced them with a cable. <coughs> One more question is open. How do we generate energy out of this? One popular option does this in two phases. In the first phase, we use the height kite, kite line uh, force to reel out the tether, the cable, and drive a generator on the, on the ground, like this. But of course, you cannot do this indefinitely. At some point, you're going to have to reel back in, right? So in the second phase, we steer the wing on a flight path with low aerodynamic forces, and we reel, it, reel back in the cable very fast. And after that, the cycle repeats continuously. Okay? And that was the basic idea from Miles Lloyd. Now, back, at, back in the day, 1980, drone technology was virtually non-existent. Yeah? And he didn't have the computing power necessary to build flying autonomous systems. Uh, so it took 20 years until the first generation of companies started to implement this concept. concept. And another 20 years later, quite a number of companies 
they are at the brink of having a commercial product with a relatively small scale system. Now the big challenge for these companies now is quite similar to the one that self-driving cars at some point had. So everything is working very well, but has to work all the time in all possible edge cases. And taking out those edge cases and getting these final percentage points, this is taking a lot of time. But they will get there. Now, when I encountered this technology at the beginning of my research career, the question that was interesting to me was, OK, but can we now decisively tackle the, the problems of wind power with this technology? And the question is, yes, but not directly. The reason is because this system experiences a lot of uh, energy losses due to friction of the cable with the air. So what you need to do is you need to transition to a, an alternative um, system where you have two wings that are rotating around a shared main cable which then barely moves. Now such a system is much more complex and it hasn't been built yet but we've tested it in very detailed simulations. Okay, but now we can really do something absolutely beautiful. Now we have a system that can operate at any altitude that we want. So we can also now place them at different locations in the sky so that they don't take wind away from each other. And therefore, we can place them really closely together at the ground and save up to 95% of the land that a conventional wind farm would use. Now, of course, we had to test this in simulation, and that's what we did. So here is a more than one kilometer high flying wind farm that produces half of Freiburg's yearly electricity needs. Now, it's clear that still a lot of challenges need to be solved before we can realize such a swarm of autonomous flying systems in the real world. But the gains, they are enormous. So this system uses only 90%, uh, uses 90% land less than the conventional wind farm did. And because it's flying at such a high altitude, it's producing a minimum amount of power for 80% of the time instead of only 50%. So I'm not saying we should build a farm exactly there. <laughs> but what I am saying is that with, with flying wind farms, we can elevate wind power to a premium energy product that is available almost anywhere, reduces variability, and minimizes the land use. And all of this at just a fraction of the material cost. Now what is needed to make this a reality? Large and sustained private financial investments to solve all of the technical challenges uh, in the real world at a fast pace. That's really necessary. But also, in the prospect of bad things coming ahead, it always helps to keep your focus strong on being and staying inventive. And I feel if we can do this all together, climate neutrality is within reach. Thank you.